Hi, my name is Kevin Goldstein and I'm here to talk about modularization. Recently, I had a couple of clients that had to go through this process and they both had the same existential questions. What is it and why do I have to do it? So let's dive into it, shall we? So what is it? Well, it's the simple process of taking these large, overcomplicated processes with hundreds of thousands or even millions of files that have these incredibly complicated interdependencies uh, amongst them and breaking them up into small, manageable pieces. You are basically isolating functionality into modules, hence the name modularization, right? There are some preconceptions that by doing this, you're gonna lose your feature set. You're gonna make your system more complicated. You're gonna make your system less complicated. There's a whole bunch of fears about what happens when you modularize your system. And the reality is it doesn't do any of that. You don't lose any of your functionality. It doesn't make your system more or less complicated. The system stays exactly as complicated as it is. It's just broken down into smaller, identifiable, manageable, isolated modules. That's it, that's all it does, right? Um, now, why do people get into this situation that they have to go through a modularization process? And there's a lot of reasons, but the primary one is architecture erosion. Before I define what architecture erosion is, let me give you an example. Let's say you start out with a greenfield project and you've got four developers and they're working on four different aspects of your system. They work for a couple of months and they come up with a, uh, a, you know, a version one of your production system and you deploy it. And pretty quickly you're going to find that you know you missed an edge case now instead of re-architecting the system to take care of that one edge case you're going to patch it right so you're just going to add on an additional little flow you're going to patch the system um that's going to save you time money expense resources the whole like nine yards right great so now you patch that system for one edge case and you know maybe two edge cases come up there um then some more time goes by and lo and behold one of your developer quits and another developer gets hired now this new developer looks at your system and says, you know, you guys did a great job uh, uh, originally, but you know, you failed to take into account a whole bunch of other stuff on how to ingest data into the system. The proper way to ingest data is by doing something that looks like this, right? So he's gonna break that up into two separate aspects of the system and he's gonna bypass the first flow. However, you can't get rid of the first flow because you've got a legacy uh, flow coming into the system. So any new flows are go through the green process and any, um, uh, legacy flows go through the original process. And that means that this output to the system, the bottom right hand corner, it has to be able to tell the difference between legacy flows and new flows. This is a pretty good example of architecture erosion, right? You've got a couple of patches going on, you got developers quitting, you got new features and functionalities being put into the system while you're maintaining uh, legacy systems. That's, that's how you get into the situation that you have to modularize your system. So the definition of architecture erosion is the gap between what was planned for actual architecture and what was actually put into production, right? Or what was actually implemented. And there's a couple of signs and symptoms to see if you're in there. And listed right here on the, on the right hand side, right? And the top four are the real big ones. I mean, top four or five are the real big ones, right? Your inability to meet requirements. So basically you wanna add uh, additional functionality to it and your developers just can't get it done. And, and there's always good reasons for not being able to get it done, but you can't get it done. Um, or if you can get it done, this ties, it ties into number two, or if you can get it done, it, it takes an inordinate, uh, an incredibly long amount of time, right? Like, so for example, I saw some, uh, some functionality where, where some developers were saying it's gonna take three years to add a simple feature to a system, which is you know, an incredibly uh, ludicrously long time, right? Um, it also means that your system suddenly stops performing. And it stops performing for a whole bunch of good reasons, but you know you're, you see increases in latency and you see decreases in, perf in, in throughput. Um, and there's always a good reason for it, right? There's always, well, this module doesn't do that. And well, we had to sort of tap something in here and, and you know, re-architect re this one particular patch. And, you know, but so the end all result is that your system suddenly isn't performing as good as it, as it used to. And your system becomes more costly. It costs more money to keep the same system running. So suddenly you'll, you'll hear that you need uh, to shell out some more cash for processing power or for additional memory um, with very little payback on that additional cost, right? In general, increase in cost should be accompanied by an increase in functionality. And in many instances, this is not the case, right? Um, it also means that because you're shaving, you're taking all these corners and you're shaving all of these, uh, the processes off, you suddenly lose quality. Your reports are including too much information or they're not including enough information or you know, they've got edge cases where 
you know, you're including information from one client where that, that really shouldn't be with another. And now you've got to have a manual check of it uh, before sending this information out. Just your, your average quality goes down because of these edge cases. And, you know, patching edge cases is never uh, uh, as simple as, it, as, as you would expect. The system becomes much more brittle, right? It has to be booted up in a very specific order. Things can't just be booted up in, in you know any order that you want. If one process crashes, the entire system has to be rebooted. Um, if one process gets updated, the entire system has to be rebooted. Um, you know, if one process if one process is taking too long, yeah, all the other processes have to stop. It becomes a very brittle and hard system to manage, right? Um, Another good symptom of uh, architecture erosion is that you have an incredibly long onboarding process. I've actually run across clients that, you know, they hire a developer and they don't really expect to have uh, any functionality of that developer for the first year because that developer is learning the system. You know, you throw them into the deep end of the pool and you say, learn all of these uh, pieces and how they interconnect with each other um, instead of getting these guys to be, uh, you know, useful right now. Um, and lastly, and this is more of a DevOps problem, but it's certainly something that causes a lot of pain and, and has made people roll back many times in the past, is it becomes difficult to release and manage these larger brittle systems, right? Um, si artifacts that are generated implicitly instead of explicitly that have to be copied from one machine to another, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These all make things managing this system much more difficult, right? So these are much more difficult, right? If you feel that your organization is experiencing any of these symptoms, you may have suffered from some architecture erosion and uh, maybe it needs to be addressed, right? So there's two main reasons for modularization, the business and the technical, right? I actually find it funny that most techies don't understand the business reticence to go through this process of modularization. And it's real simple. It's the fact that business people realize that techies cost money to maintain. You can't just go off and work on a project uh, because you think it's cool and appropriate and it's gonna be a good design for the system. Um, you know, you're now taking up time, space, and money that otherwise could be spent on other projects. So we need to have a good justification for going through this whole process, um, you know, business-wise before we can start it. And then of course the justification for doing it technically as well. So let's jump into some of the reasons of going through justifications. Before we talk about that, let's talk about what modularization would have looked like in this uh, hypothetical uh, uh, architecture that I drew out, right? What you're going to do is you're going to break each of these aspects into separate modules isolated by functionality and you'll assign a different resource to that module. So for example, this new input methodology is going to be one module, right? The processing methodology is going to be another module. Um, the output methodology would be a third module and, you know, the validation and uh, legacy uh, in, in input methodology would be the fourth module, right? Um, what's the benefits of doing this? So first of all, what you end up doing is you take your four developers, your four development groups, and you don't say you're responsible for the entire uh, entirety of the system. You say you're responsible for an individual module. So you're now using your resources more efficiently. That means that your your developers don't have to be a jack of all trades and a master of none, right? Your developers have to be a master of that particular module. And that leads to hardening up your code. That leads to doing a lot better testing. And that leads to wanting to do continuous integration. That leads to wanting to do functional testing, right? That leads to, to wanting to make sure that the modules are being used in the way that they were designed. And if there's a difference in that use, being able to identify it and figure out what the best use of the module is, right? This is a much, much more efficient way of running things. And all of the stuff that I just said has a side effect of making your system uh, tested and hardened in a way that you're not going to lose those qualities, right? It also means that you can onboard a, pro uh, a developer a lot faster, right? You can assign a new new developer to module B. So instead of throwing them at uh, throwing the kitchen sink at them and saying go learn the entire architecture, you can say you're going to go look at module B, and you're going to become very very good at module B. Now that doesn't mean that you can't move them around as required. It just means that they don't have to learn the whole system from the get go right so you're able to onboard and get developers much uh, and get developers uh, useful much quicker right that also means that you have a lower cost of code it's a lot faster for developers to to work on their code and it's a lot faster for developers to find the bugs and uh, uh, side effects that they're introducing into their system right um, and it also means because you've got these smaller modules and because these modules are becoming more bulletproof, that you're gonna have a faster time to market. You're gonna be able to do individual module updates without actually having to do giant releases, without having to stop the world and do everything else. You work on an individual module and you're gonna be able to get that thing released 
uh, patch bugs, fix issues, and get it released to, to the system much faster. So you're gonna have faster release times as well as single module uh, inputs. Great, so those are your business reasons. The next question is, why, do you, why would you do it from a technical perspective, right? So overall, it's just a better design. You know, when you suddenly start uh, working on systems that have hundreds of thousands or even millions of files, it's unlikely that a, a, that a person is able to keep all those files straight in their head, right? You know, it's a, it's a lot better to have somebody concentrating on an individual module and become an expert in, in all the use cases and edge cases of how that module is being used, built, and, and, uh, and performing, right? Um, and it also turns out that you suddenly start reusing modules a lot better, right? So what's really common in these large monolithic systems that somebody will say, oh, that's a great file. It, it, it does exa almost, what I, almost exactly what I want, but not quite. So I'm gonna take that file and I'm gonna copy it. And now you've gotta maintain two different files without the system that, that basically have almost identical functionality, but because of how the system is built, it's a copy and not an import. Um, and suddenly you've got uh, divergence of those two files. So you've got to maintain two, two code bases of things that actually don't do the same thing, they do similar things. And in a modular uh, in a modular approach, you would just talk to the developers who are responsible for that module, right? Those developers would say yes or no, this is a good update or it's not, and they would give you a solution that you can approach, right? It, so it lets you work on your single isolated piece of code. It allows you to enhance and evaluate your code um, in a much uh, much more sane fashion, which is sort of the example that I also gave of reusing individual files. You're not copying files, right? You're you're depending on it and you're enhancing it, talking to subject matter experts instead of you having to be responsible for things flowing throughout your entire system, right? As far as development goes, it gives you a very clear dependency tree. This is something that's uh, it's actually uh, under undervalued when working on these large monolithic systems. You make a, one change to a file here and says, well, where does it, which part of the system does it affect? Well, we, we don't really know. We think it affects, you know, sections A through C, but you don't really have a, a good answer for that. And with this, it gives you a great answer with that. You can see what your, what your dependency tree is and see very clearly which, um, uh, sections of your of your system are going to be affected. Um, it helps you minimize downstream effects, right? Because you're doing that uh, module uh, QA, because you're doing that unit testing, because you're doing all of that stuff. Um, you know, you know where the downstream side effects are going to come in because you also have that clear dependency tree, right? It also helps isolate uh, debugging functionality, um, whereas you know that a particular bug will be constrained to a module and then you can sort of see where, how that's going to filter down through that dependency tree. Because of all the testing that I just spoke about, um, it, you're going to be increasing reliability. Now, another thing that, that this helps with is because you have that because you're more focused on an isolated piece of code, right? You should be increasing your readability of code. Most developers have gone through this where, you know, you look back at a piece of code that you wrote six months or a year ago, and you're having a hard time understanding it. And man, this is code that you wrote, right? So imagine how hard it's going to be for somebody who's never read, you know, for a new hire, who's never, you know, doesn't know you or has never read your code before having to figure out what that stuff means. So readability is actually something that a lot of developers don't feel that's very important, but it is important from a uh, functionality, from an onboarding and from a cost of coding perspective. And lastly, you've got versions, right? You can upgrade the version of your module and when people are ready to start using it, they can increase that version as well, uh, build and test, and then that version functionality will just filter down by definition of it. You don't have to do these big bang releases. Uh, quickly, I'd just like to give a good reference. There's a great article that talks about um, Architecture erosion is listed right here. Uh, and then very quickly, two quick insights, right? Architecture erosion is most prevalent with badly run agile setups, right? Like you get into this two week sprint and nobody wants to talk about re-architecting the system or nobody wants to talk about patching the whole architecture of the system because you have to deliver something in two weeks. So you just do a patch and then you patch the patch and you patch the patch instead of the patch. Um, so agile itself is not responsible for this, but agile certainly makes this more um, feasible. <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, another great, uh, uh, another insight that I have is that monolithic builds tend to not have uh, individual unit tests. They tend to not have a uh, CICD setup. They tend to not have automated uh, functional testing setup. They tend to have people actually sitting down with an Excel spreadsheet of, you know, 
5,000 use cases that they have to put their system through or something like that. So modularization actually, so first of all, um, in, that, in that scenario, people are probably gonna miss something and modularization is something that helps with that use case, right? Like as you modularize things, you're introducing unit tests. As you, mo as you modularize stuff, you're introducing uh, integration tests, functional tests, CICDs and all that other stuff. All right, that's it for today. Uh, as usual, my email's uh, listed on the slides. If you have any questions or comments, please get in touch with me. Thanks and happy coding, everybody.